before Dragon Ball Super. One of the biggest questions in the Dragon Ball fandom was what happened to Goku after his battle with Frieza. What if we didn't just get a few glances, but an entire special or arc dedicated to his time and training on Planet Yardrak? As Goku screams out in helplessness after the defeat of Frieza, there's nothing left he can do to avoid his demise along with Planet Namek. He can only think of his wife, son, and all of his friends at this time. He's sorry he didn't get to say goodbye to all of them. But it's too late. He can never get off this planet now. It seems like he'll die with this world. But at the very least, he takes solace in the knowledge that he was able to rid the universe of that tyrant. When he spots something. A space capsule. It looks similar to the one he saw Vegeta use. Snapping back into action. This might be his only chance. He jumps into the vessel and happens to hit the correct buttons to close the door, though not knowing anything about how to work ships like these. He can only button mash and pray that this goes his way. And as fate would be on his side, he rapidly propels to the sky. Although escaping the planet's destruction, he has no idea where he's going. But one thing's for sure, he will find his friends. It wouldn't take long for Goku to soon drift off into a deep slumber. Unbeknownst to him, the space capsule is leading him to a strange planet. Six days into his journey. Crash landing on a foreign world. The native people quickly rush to see what the commotion's all about, one becoming concerned seeing his injured state. At the planet's capital, a fishy face offers an up-close greeting to our protagonist. Alarmed and springing out of bed, Goku questions where he is and who they are. Who introduces herself as Nori, which is a seaweed that acts as a binder glued to sushi. She explains to the spaceman that he's currently on Planet Yardrat. But Planet Yardrat? He's never heard of that before. She inquires where he comes from. From which world does he hail? Prompting him to return the courtesy. His name is Son Goku, and he comes from Earth. Moving past the initial formalities, she then tells how his arrival has caused a lot of fear. Cards on the table. She pleads for him not to attack them as they're a species of pacifists. Other than that, he can take all the time he needs to regain his strength. Well, likely not the wisest of words to say to a possible barbaric invader, Goku assures they have nothing to worry about. He just wants to get back home. Giving Nori the segue needed to offer him a new outfit. His previous clothes have been torn to pieces. Disrobing. The alien quickly makes her coyness known. Leave it to Goku to go full pickle in front of a complete stranger. Though, perhaps his carefree attitude has had an unintended consequence on his new friend. She's hypnotized! Ball struck! He makes that Yardrite outfit look good, and she thinks she's found her Prince Charming. But socially ignorant, he's gotta admit that it's actually a little uncomfortable. It'll take some time to get used to. What does she think? Who cuts right to the chase and demands that he engage his mandibles and kiss her? But no, he doesn't want to! Somehow moving faster than the speed of light. Goku jets away from the awkward situation as quick as he can, pleading for help from anyone around just to get him out of here. Finding the exit. If he can find the ship that brought him here, he can leave and before she materializes out of thin air using a new ability we've never ever ever seen before. Using the same paralyzing technique as Goldo, Nori catches the Saiyan by surprise and freezes him in place. And for someone who really seems to want to do some PG-13 things to Goku, this is coming off pretty Cosby. Smashing him in the face like a refreshing can of Twisted Tea. The warrior can't help but laugh that it looks like Chi-Chi has gone and turned herself into a yard rat. She playfully, and kind of creepily, Taunts wherever he goes, she will find him. 
Her love can't hide from her. But someone else teleports to the area to scold the Ardradian. He tells her to leave the Saiyan alone and stop bothering him. Prompting her to bid him goodbye for now. The other requests their visitor's forgiveness for her attitude. Something Goku simply tries to uncomfortably laugh off. Apologizing, the man puts two fingers to his forehead and instructs that he must come with him. <laughs> Teleporting the two of them to a new location. We find a different type of life form. At least, he doesn't appear to be of Yardrat descent. He turns to our hero with a question. Is he a member of the Ginyu Force? But not at all! He has nothing to do with Ginyu and his men. If that's the case, why did he arrive in one of their ships? Something that's easily explained away. When he commandeered it, he actually didn't know whose it was. They came to Namek and he defeated them before one of his allies, referring to Vegeta, killed them all. What? The Ginyu Force has been defeated? Just who is this guy? As always, Goku merely introduces himself by name and a Saiyan from Earth. Which, at least according to their information, that's impossible. The Saiyans all died from a meteorite strike, a hoax that meant a lot more to any Saiyan not named Goku, who only quips, and yet here I stand. The alien then believes that if he's still alive, he must not have met the tyrant of the universe yet. Though he means Frieza, doesn't he? It was probably the most difficult fight of his life. Their battle tore the planet asunder, but eventually Frieza's pride got the better of him. He died along with a planet that he chose to destroy. Still in disbelief at all these wild claims, what if true? The invincible Frieza has been vanquished. What sort of power does this man possess? He tells Goku that he's eternally grateful for taking out these threats. His name is Soba. He comes from Yardrat's cousin planet. One day, the Ginyu Force landed on his world and exterminated the population. He fought them with everything he had, and although he was able to take one of them down, which is how you build lore, Broly! Which actually did a pretty great job other than this little bit. The rest overwhelmed him and left him for dead. He managed to reach Yardrat with one of the ships they left behind. The Yardrats avoided being exterminated by Frieza's family by offering spacecraft maintenance services. It was a fragile piece at best. He knew that one day, the Yardrat people would once again be in danger. He had to become stronger to protect them. For Goku to take down Frieza, he must wield unimaginable power. Soba reaches out his hand to express that on behalf of the Ardradian people, he thanks him for freeing them all. Pretty much ignoring the gratitude, the Saiyan wants to ask him something. Could he teach him that teleportation technique? The one the other used to zap the both of them here. Soba apologizes, but he himself doesn't know how to do that. Ardradian tradition demands that it must be taught by the wisest among them, but he's been in hiding since Soba himself made a deal with Frieza's family. The visitor is welcome to stay as long as he wishes if he wants to seek him out. Immediately dashing off, Goku thanks him and begins a search. Unable to sense this wise guy's location, Goku has been flying for hours now. Spotting a delightful looking blood colored lake, he figures he should take a break and this place looks perfect. Landing, it's time to stretch a little. On a familiar style ship out in space. Someone zips into the presence of none other than King Cold. The Overlord hisses to know who dares approach him so unannounced. He can give up all hope of ever leaving here alive. Revealing the Archer from be- Oh, I remember you. Shaking in his boots, Cold against a man to know who he is to disturb him. The Archer offers his greetings and regrets for the intrusion, but he has some very important information to pass on to him. Listening, the king scolds that it better be worth his life. A few days ago, a stranger crash landed on planet Yardrat. He appeared on a ship belonging to the Ginyu Force. This stranger identifies himself as a member of the Saiyan race and claims to have defeated the Ginyu Force. 
the demon only scoffs at this. The Ginyus would have done well to focus on their training rather than indulging in their lust for pointless traumatic flair. However, this isn't all. The same could be said for Lord Frieza. What? Frieza defeated by a lowly Saiyan monkey? Impossible! Good old Ratface tries to quiver out an apology, but he's only the messenger. Cold curses those filthy apes. He will not allow their family name and empire to both be stained by simian swine. He will kill every last one of those bastards! As for the Yard Rat, he remembers saying that he wouldn't leave here alive. getting what he deserved. Cold rushes out to demand his pilots immediately chart a course for planet Namek. And someone get over here to clean up this mess. Back on Yardrat. <laughs> Suddenly feeling an intense key. Where is it coming from? Strange. Goku thought he was alone out here. Could it be that wise old man Soba told him about? His key disappeared again. He can control it. So our hero's gonna have to force him out of hiding. The idea working like a charm. Goku finds himself face to face with an old Yardradian. He tells the Saiyan that he has a really strange way of welcoming people. Who is he and what does he want? He introduces himself as Goku. Is he the wise Yardrat? He's been looking for him for a while who confirms he is indeed, before instructing him to follow. Inside the cave. The old man was kind enough to prepare a big meal for his visitor, and he cooks pretty well. As his host can see, Gofish here is such a dirty glutton, he's eaten almost all of his provisions. He's a very strange man. Although, Goku could say the same about the Yardrats. They have some amazing abilities. Could Grandpa here tell him more about him? But Grandpa, the name is Hushu. Those abilities. He himself was the one who taught them to the others. Without him, the Ardradian people would be doomed. He defended the people here against invaders who had come seeking colonization of the planet, or coveted their teleportation techniques. He continued this role until the day he met Soba. He felt he had the makings of a leader. So after a while, he let him take his place. But when he found out that he had abdicated his responsibilities, after facing the Ginyu Force, he felt tremendous shame. He believed himself to have somehow made an error in judgment leaving Soba in his steed, so he exiled himself to this region. However, he doesn't have to worry about that. Goku's already taken care of the Ginyu Force. And, really? Really and truly? How can he ever thank him? Predictable as ever, Goku suggests a one-on-one -on -one match between the two of them an idea the old-timer is happy to grant. With Goku making friends with the natives of this world, and some not-so-natives, how long will it take him to master the instant transmission? And with the traitor Yardrat alerting King Cole to the situation, does this mean Goku's presence on Yardrat is ultimately what led to Frieza's survival? As thanks for taking out the Ginyu Force, or at least playing a large role in it, Hushu grants Goku the request of a one-on-one -on -one spar. The Saiyan can move at such speed. The Elder didn't even see him flinch. Landing a benign kick, Ushu jostles to let him know when the fight starts. Clearly adept at his evasion abilities, Goku only hopes he doesn't spend the entire fight dodging. Grabbing his foot, Goku giggles that it looks like he got him. He spins and swoops him around all the while chortling how light he is. The Elder, on the other hand, curses the fool to let him go. Tossing him over the nearby lake, Ushu has lost sight of the Saiyan. Where did he go? Sneaking up on him from behind, Goku shoves him into the water, chirping that he needs a bath. Causing his foe to become irritated, his visitor will learn not to judge a book by its cover. Because of him, his clothes are soaked. The Saiyan goads him on. If he's so angry, he should start getting serious then. Who tells the young man to prepare himself. Now he will see exactly what he's made of. 
using an ability similar to the multi-form technique. Well, this isn't something new to our hero. This guy's speed isn't helping keep an eye on all of them. Getting in a few kicks, Hushu implores Goku to give up. He's completely outmatched. But using the Kaioken, he isn't even slightly concerned about this newest development. Fully firing it up, the Elder can't believe this monstrous energy. He can't keep fighting this. But both of them returning to normal. Goku's a little confused. His copies have all disappeared. Does he give up? Alas, no. It seems the old man's body has given up. As he crashes to the ground, Goku asks what's wrong. He holds him as the elder explains that he pushed himself a little too much. This has been happening on a regular basis for a few years now. They should go home. He needs to rest. February 3rd, 763. King Cold has arrived to where planet Namek once existed. One of his henchmen confirms that it does appear that the planet has been totally destroyed. However, on the screen, isn't that his son? But what did he say? His son Frieza? Sure enough, as the officer ushers his majesty to see for himself, at least what remains of him is among the debris. The king orders that his body must be recovered immediately and placed into a regenerative capsule. That means that Yardradian was telling the truth. He then instructs his men to send his personal squadron to planet Namek. They're on orders to kill that Saiyan on sight. And if they can't do it, he'll rip the head off that filthy monkey himself. In about 10 days time, Soba senses a powerful energy before a massive explosion rumbles the planet. Spinning his head over to where he too must feel the energy signatures, Goku confusedly questions what's going on, though it's all too obvious to the leader. It's an attack. Shedding tears, Hushu stutters to Son Goku that he is their only hope. The Ardrats have no chance against these enemies, not even Soba. He asks as a favor, if he's able to defeat them, he will teach him the teleportation technique. Already causing havoc in a nearby village. The planetary defense arrives to order them to cease their misconduct and state their identities. Introducing us to Yamori, Shamo, and Shima. They are the elite special guard of King Cold, the emperor of the universe. He's ordered them to destroy everything on this planet. Again, the defensive force orders them to leave in peace, or they will fight them till their last breath. Guiding Shima to charge a key ball and spell that it's honorable that they have such a strong sense of duty towards the people of this world. As the Ardradians do everything in their power to get to safety. She wipes them all out instantly, even thinking she may have overdone it a bit. However, one still clings to life. Under debris, he cries that these monsters will pay for this. Before meeting a brutal end. Arriving just a bit too late, Soba curses the gang that he will kill them all. Shima replies that this must be the leader of these weaklings. He doesn't seem very powerful either. Shamo inquires if that's true, before ironically apologizing and cackling about the mess. Causing him to shout if they think it's funny to attack a race of pacifists. Charging after him. Though the Birdman isn't shy about confronting him. They destroyed everything, both the village and all of its inhabitants. He sees the helmets of his men lying in the dust. His nightmare begins anew after already destroying his home world. They once again attack him. He can't take it anymore. This must stop now. Firing at his foe with everything he's got. All he's done is make him mad. This guy is unbelievable to still be standing. Shimatan said it's shocking, isn't it? Shamo is the toughest of them all. As Yamori sneaks up on him, taking him by surprise, he grabs him by the neck and hisses that if he wants to hurt him, he'll have to hit a lot harder. But the avian warrior wants this fight all to himself, demanding his comrade release him. 
He again begs the invaders to leave his people in peace. Which actually isn't out of the question, if the murdering death squad is to be believed. All they want to know is where the Saiyan is hiding. And the Saiyan? Soba lies and claims he doesn't know where he is. But that's the wrong answer. The villain screeches that he will suffer the same fate as his people. Launching him into the air, he signals Yamori to finish him. Something he's happy to oblige. When Nori arrives just in time to get him out of harm's way. Though what are they doing here? Soba shouts they need to get away from the battlefield. Nori assures that their people are in a safe place. They've come to help him. The warrior's confused by her wording. What does she mean by we? As someone fires at the blue fighter, a voice is heard shouting, None of you will leave here alive! This is the end of the road! Appearing to be the teleporter's cue to get him back to action. Goku, of course. Barely avoiding that blast, this guy wields crazy power. Could he be? The Saiyan bellow is that he doesn't know who they are, but they're not welcome here. They're gonna pay for what they've done to these people. Flipping her hair, it all makes sense now. She supposes that he's the Saiyan who defeated Lord Frieza. And that's him. If they've come seeking revenge, then they can fight him and leave these people alone. With the battle ramping back up, Soba instructs Nori and Bandan to leave. The two of them will take care of them. Something Goku agrees with, but he at least wants to test their strength himself first. Facing off against his first foe since defeating the Galactic Overlord himself mere days ago. How strong could these three possibly be to be the right-hand men of King Cold? Could they be on par with the Ginyu Force? Or much more fierce? Wanting some answers, Goku wants to know who in particular sent them to kill him. Without any qualms revealing this, Shima admits that it was King Cold, the father of Frieza. But the father of Frieza? Clearly the two of them had no idea such a being existed. The trio doesn't know what he has against them, and they really don't care. They have their orders to destroy him by any means necessary. Yamori states that he finds it hard to believe that a vulgar Saiyan could defeat Lord Frieza. Kind of disproving the claims that they don't know what Cold has against him, but it's three against two. If he doesn't struggle, soon he'll be able to join his Yardrat friends in the afterlife. This leads our hero to retort that they're just as pretentious as the Ginyu Force. That arrogance will cost them. Causing Shamo to belt out in laughter. The Ginyu Force? Those bunch of clowns? Simply listening in on their conversation, Soba wonders how his ally is able to remain calm through all these insults. But Yamori has had enough of the waiting. He's ready to get this party started. With the battle between Yardrat's greatest defender, Goku, and King Cold's right-hand men commencing. Just how powerful is this trio? Although Hushu seems to believe Soba stands little chance, are they really formidable enough for Cold to believe they can eliminate the warrior who defeated Frieza himself? As Shima approaches, the defender of Yardra jumps between her and the sand. He commands that she'll go no further and she is to face him. However, Goku interferes to warn his friend not to try anything. She's too strong for him. Walking right by him almost as an insult, she agrees with her target, urging him to get lost. Looking at Goku, she boasts that he may have strength, but she has strategy. As he boorishly rushes up to her and punches her in the face. A lot of good that strategy's doing for her. Her foe again implores that they need to get out of here right now or they're gonna regret it. Only able to spectate, the proud warrior finds himself feeling useless in this battle. The Saiyan is much more experienced than himself. To interfere would only be to embarrass him. Finessing all three at once, he quickly disappears leaving them to frantically try to locate his position. Though the Birdman sees that he's heading right for him. Yeah. 
Goku's Hoba is astounded by what he's seen. Not only is Goku winning the fight, he's only increasing his power as it continues. But now glowing, Yamori thinks his adversary is a little too confident. He has a surprise for him. Transforming into some kind of lizardman, he chuckles if he's surprised by this evolution. Blocking the blast, Shamo beckons if they should go help him out. But no way. Shima tells him to shut up. This Saiyan is amazing and she wants to watch him. Taking him back that his enemy is more or less able to tank his last attack. Yamori admits that he's quite tough. But that won't be enough. Prompting our hero to take on a glow of his own. If that's the case, he'll show him the power of the Kaioken. This technique. No! Just as it seems that one of the three is taken down. One of the goons uses some kind of whistle to attack the hearing of our protagonist. So much so, it causes him to fall to the ground. His ally rushes over, promising to hold them off while he recovers. But no! He's only going to get himself killed! Although we certainly seen better days. Yamori hisses at Soba not to move. The Earthling finds his way back to his feet, but is still a little dizzy. <laughs> Cole's mercenaries take full advantage of their foe continuing not to be able to focus. Throwing him around like a ragdoll, Shamo comments that the Saiyan is really pitiful. Before Shima pierces him to finish it, they've already wasted too much time. Who doesn't argue? After all, she is the boss. Placing his boot on the target's head, he taunts if he knows what they do with bugs like him. They crush him! When a voice enters Goku's mind, he needs to think of all the innocents that depend on him. He has to stop these monsters! But the sound... Is that Hushu? Causing him to say aloud that he's right. These invaders have to pay. Oh, shit. Offering yet another warning, he yells at him to leave this planet now. With their adversary coming to his senses, the fiend knows he can't even hurt him anymore. Reinforcing this, the former scolds him to give up. His technique won't work again. Now stay down! Leading Shima to bellow for the Saiyan not to try to tell him what to do. Not thinking he's going to be able to stop it in time, Goku does have one idea. Firing a blast from his body itself, Soba congratulates his ally on a job well done who turns to the others, asking if they've had enough yet. Meanwhile, that same blast makes its way towards Shima. Although careening her off the planet, their key is sensed moving away. She's still alive. Captain Falcon springs from the dirt to grunt for the Saiyan not to celebrate just yet. He's still standing. In space, we see the blue ginger is barely able to escape the counterattack. She thinks to herself, what colossal might. The Saiyan is far too powerful for any of them. If he really did manage to beat Lord Frieza, then why would King Cold think they could defeat him? Either way, they either accomplish their mission or die, giving us our answer on their strength. As Yamori and Soba just kind of hang out, the latter states if he wishes to fight the Saiyan, he'll have to get past him first. And given the state he's in, he won't get very far. Causing him to chuckle if he still hasn't noticed. The Saiyan did indeed damage him significantly, but he only needs a few more minutes to regenerate completely, during which he will pose no challenge. Though Soba's ready to give his life if it's going to allow Goku to destroy him.
that he must hold out as long as he can. This will let Goku defeat him one at a time. This technique had no effect on the Ginyu Force. But if he doesn't try every trick he's got, then he won't last long. His enemy's happy to see that he still has some fire in him. How brave and stupid. The defender's aware that it may seem foolish to him, but so long as he draws breath, he will keep fighting. While at first the multi form may not seem like the most useful technique in this situation, but let's see how 10 arms do against one. Finding himself surrounded, this idea has clearly frustrated the villain. And maybe working a little different than the multi form, Soba calls out he's exhausted, so it's up to all of them now. Happy to see his ally can use the same move as that old man. Perhaps Goku should be doing less spectating and more helping. As Yamori leaps into the air to put an end to this right now with his backhand of destruction. Teleporting away with the others. It's only now that his clones are eliminated that he sees they should have stayed where they were. They're not experienced enough in combat for this. They're gonna get killed. Using his tail to pierce Soba's chest. The bad guy is surprised to see him still standing. He is a real warrior. But the party's over. It's time to say goodbye to his people. Communicating telepathically, Yardrat's defender tells Nori that he's going to need her for his next attack. She must immobilize them. She can't fail. He then shouts out to the Earthling not to interfere in this. This is their fight. Who logically was likely about to, either knocking out or taking out Shamo. He pretty much just goes, oh, I understand. Do your best, buddy. Or as the Lizardman begins to panic, unable to move his body. Soba doesn't hesitate and rushes in to end him. This is for all the yard rides he slaughtered. In his final moments, Yamori reflects on how he was the last survivor of his people. His entire race was wiped out by a band of intergalactic warriors. When he was eventually recruited to serve as part of King Cold's private guard, he couldn't have been prouder. But all hopes he has of rising from the ashes of his people's demise to become something greater than them in their honor have been sucked into the void. It seems the tapestry of his life has come to an end on this backwater planet. He feels so ashamed, only hoping for his king, who never even cared about him in the first place, can forgive him. With Cold's personal his squad falling from three members to two, will the others finally realize this is a battle they cannot win and strategize a way for them all to team up against the Tyrant's Empire? Or will they continue to simply double down, knowing they either die to the Saiyan or die to their king? Putting him out of his misery, Shima returns to tell Yamori to rest in peace. Acknowledging her arrival, while Goku knew better, Pierce Soba was thinking the battle was over. Even Shamo picks himself from the rubble. He screams out to his leader that she'll wait her turn. He was fighting him before she got back. Again showing disrespect and chirping back to him to shut up, she bluntly states that this Saiyan has been kicking the guano out of him. He can go kill the Yard Rats instead. While compliant, he warns that after he's done with them, he wants his fight. Heading after him, the ginger stops him in his tracks. He's not going anywhere until he beats her. Spotting the Yard Rats, the bird is delighted to find his lost toys. The other Yardratian tells Bondon to go find Nori. She's hiding somewhere. He'll take care of this guy. Shima has to inquire if he really is a Saiyan. When she sees him fighting, he doesn't seem like he's trying to kill him. Who promptly responds it's because they're not worth it. Although he may not have power. The Archrod only hopes that his speed and savvy will buy a little time. He spouts to the invader that strength grants little benefit without foresight. Who can't help but chuckle and agree. Huh. 
Soba fires a blast as the Fiend seems to obliterate the other Yardrat. Even though it doesn't do much. That was his last attack. The savior of this world falls backwards beginning to lose consciousness. Again. This doesn't do much damage, but it works really well to make him mad. Shamo screams that he's going to pay for that. Looking over, Goku wants to know what that guy's planning. Jumping in the way, somehow he can't believe that someone, a mercenary death soldier of one of the most evil creatures in the universe no less, would attack a man on the ground. They're nothing but cowards. Still awake. Soba does his best to thank Goku for the save, who assures he fought well, but he'll take it from here. Sporting a... New do. The grunt clocks his fist grumbling for the Saiyan to prepare for his final hour. Of course, our hero tells him to do the same. Handling him with ease, the ginger remains confident he won't escape him. Regrouping, Shamo knows this guy is strong, but there's no way he'll survive their ultimate attack. Creating something they call the Thunder Eagle is coming in too fast. As the smoke clears, it looks like they got him. He must have been disintegrated. No one has ever survived that attack. He'll be no exception. However, it looks like Nori got to him just in time. Thank you, her. Goku lets her know how awesome that was, but he has to finish this fight. Firing at him and shouting it's not over. Now Shamo realizes what's going on. It was because of this Yardra that Saiyan was able to survive their attack. She must perish. Quickly running over and grabbing her, she cries out for Goku to help. The bird taunting him to hurry and do so if he can. Her hero hollers for him to release her. She can't even defend herself. And if that's what he wants. This level of malice and evil echoing the exact scenario on Namek which caused the Super Saiyan transformation. He can't help but feel that he has yet again failed to save someone who called out to him directly. He trembles that he's going to pay for that. He unleashes the same power he used to put down even the likes of Frieza himself. With this, it looks like the good guys have won. Eliminating the Sinister Fiend previously known as Shamo, Goku turns to the last remaining member of Cold Squadron. He warns if she doesn't want to suffer the same fate, she needs to leave immediately. She's a decent warrior, but with her current power, she doesn't stand a chance. He has her pegged as the strongest of her group, but she's not even close to Frieza. Not willing to accept this fate, she barks back if he really wants to try her. He can take on her Plasma Crunch. After the blast lands, she thinks that likely did it. And she did it all right. Again, the Saiyan hisses that he tried to warn her that she couldn't hurt him. But this is impossible! This guy isn't real! He just tanked that attack head on! Relentless in his attempts to spare her life, he yells for her to give up. She's lost this fight. Get lost and don't ever come back to Planet Yardride or she'll regret it. Get out of here now and he will let her live. But is this what he really wants? He might regret it. When Hushu rushes over to urge him to finish the job, 
They can't take any chances with her. She and her alliances are far too dangerous for the safety of this world. Head in the clouds. Goku believes everyone deserves a second chance. Many of his former enemies have become present allies. Anyway, he's going to stay around here for a while. If there's any problem, he will intervene. Shima turns away. A scoffs for him not to expect a thank you. A cool breeze passes through the battlefield. The planet Yardra was at peace. And seemingly just in time, Goku falls out of his Super Saiyan form and groans that he can't take it anymore. Asking what's wrong, Hushu worries what's happening to Goku. It's his stomach. He's starving. Grabbing Soba, Bondon is surprised to see his elder. He tells how the chief is in pretty bad shape, but fortunately still alive. Who responds that they'll treat him. They're also going to need reinforcements to rebuild the destroyed village. Meanwhile, a couple hundred miles away, Shima reminisces on how she always trained to be a great warrior. Initially, she did so in order to defend those suffering oppression, but she had to suppress that desire the day space pirates conquered her planet. The men were exterminated and the women enslaved. It wouldn't be long before they'd be sold off to be tortured and humiliated. With every passing day, her anger grew. Eventually, she couldn't bear to live like that anymore. She destroyed her oppressors with the help of a powerful king. She and Cold shared a common enemy. That's how he recruited her to be the leader of his elite squadron. That day, she thought she was finally free. Even if she didn't share King Cold's ideologies, at least she could fight. But after seeing that Saiyan fight with such conviction to save a race that he barely knew, she remembered the goal she had originally set for herself. She's going to have to drop off the grid. King Cold will never forgive her for failing this mission. With the planet Yardra saved, and Goku managing to spare at least one life that would have also been lost, we're left to wonder if King Cold will attempt to track down Shima to punish her for her failure. Also, what will his plans for Yardra be after discovering the Saiyan who killed his son is still alive? Taking it back to Yardra. The Ardradian people are busy rebuilding the damage caused by Cold's elite squadron. Even Goku helped. Simultaneously, Sobo is recovering from his injuries. It would appear that he soon received a letter of some kind. It reads, Dear Soba, I'm writing this letter to you because I fear I've done something unforgivable. I know why Cold's elite squadron attacked our world. Because I told them the Saiyan was taking refuge here. I was terrified that if I didn't tell them, he would kill all of our people as an example to his other subjects. I couldn't risk breaking his trust, especially after the backroom bargain you made with the Ginyu Force. I need you to understand. I truly believed I was doing what was in Yardrat's best interest. I didn't mean for this to happen. If I could take it back, I would. Their blood is on my hands, Soba. And if I'm still alive, I'll spend every waking moment trying to atone for my sins. This wasn't your fault, my friend. Signed Wakami, Nori's brother and the leader of the Yardrat army. So does this mean that putrid coward of a warrior, more a dry decaying husk than an actual respectable sentient life form, that cowering, stale, pink hostess snowball that's filling has surely been removed and replaced with the same emptiness that fills his pride, is not only still alive, but upon coming back, if ever, he'll find out that his cowardice not only got an entire village killed, but also his own sister. Earth equivalent of February 763 comes to an end. Goku offers Soba the compliment that he's become a lot stronger. Zipping in, it looks like Bondon honed in a little too close to their location as he's almost accidentally dragged into the spar. Curious what he's doing here. It's told that the venerable Hushu wants to see him. He has something important for him. Although Goku is simply enthralled to what it might be, this information sends Soba into a panic. They must go immediately. Meeting the old timer at what could be the damaged village. Bondon apologizes, but he's pretty tired after all these trips. He's gonna take five. Explaining to him what he's been summoned for, Soba can't believe it. Hushu's telling him that he's an inhabitant from his planet? Which you'd expect wasn't a secret.
Goku jokes that next he's gonna say he's his father or something. And... yeah. Since Goku's also here, he has something to give him for valiantly fighting against their enemies. He would like to reward his courage by teaching him the instant transmission. Kaida's stabbing him in the back a bit. Soba leans in to inquire if he really wants to teach that technique to, uh, Saiyan. But Goku reminds that he can hear him. The Elder smirks that his protege has gotten the best of what he's been taught, just meaning that his instilled perceived value still holds strong. Hushu believes that he may be a Saiyan, and the instant transmission is usually reserved for they and the Ardradians. He is also the savior of their people. Meekly apologizing, Goku takes this opportunity to spell that as soon as he learns this technique, he'll go back to Earth. Lightening up a bit, though still a little snobbish, Soba remarks that Goku isn't worthy of Hushu's teachings dressed like that. He'll be right back. He has to get him in the traditional Yardrite outfit. He must take advantage of the venerable Hushu's advice. He's going to need it. Dashing away, Soba's elated to finally have met the fabled Hushu. And yet, he's strangely familiar to the warrior. While he thinks about this, said fable mentions to our hero that he transformed himself during his fight with the Elite Squadron. More of a question than a statement. Who admits that this is true, but he can't do it at will. The first time he transformed was against Frieza. The wise man then reveals that he was able to read the Saiyan's mind. He's come to understand that it was the brutal death of his friend that awakened this power sleeping within him. He felt that same anger when one of the Ardradians was murdered. He can teach him how to control that anger so the transformation isn't merely spontaneous. Without control over his rage, he could very well become a danger to his allies just as much as his enemies. This is all kind of crazy to Goku. He knows a ton about him without saying a word. Which is kind of funny considering he did the same to Krillin upon him first arriving to Namek. Hushu explains that the Yardrat said himself were forced to develop psychic skills to determine who is trustworthy or not. He wants to begin right away. Goku needs to get angry and show him the rage inside of him. But get angry? He has no reason to get angry. Does he have any ideas? Though he doesn't know, maybe he can try thinking of some friends that he's lost in previous battles. Seeming to do the trick. This is impressive, but he doesn't look the same as last time. They're gonna have to work on this transformation of his. The anger that he feels in this moment lacks control. He has to be able to remain calm while somehow maintaining that anger. Powering down, he can already tell that this is gonna be a pretty big challenge mastering this thing. When they spot Soba heading back to him, Landing with the aforementioned clothes, Goku is just finally happy to be able to learn instant transmission. He hands over the uniform asking the Saiyan to please accept this gift as a token of his integration into the Yardrat race. Never one for words, our hero simply thanks him. Quickly putting it on, the old timer thinks he looks great. Who thanks him for the compliment, and of course, the people of Yardrat as a whole. Before the Elder teaches them the instant transmission, he'd like to offer some history. His people and that of the Yardrats are the only ones who know this technique. He taught it to them when he learned of Frieza's plans to conquer them all. But in the beginning, the purpose of this technique was to allow fast and convenient travel between planets with sentient populations so they can make contact. Thanks to this, they've been able to carry out numerous commercial exchanges and allow the development of their civilization. Sometimes, he refused to teach it when he doubted the intentions of those who wanted to learn. On his own planet, some haven't hesitated to use it to commit criminal acts. That's why ever since, he's only taught it to the Yardrat people, given their peaceful race. He then asks Soba if he knows how to feel the key of people around him. And of course, it's a basic skill for a warrior. Then for Goku, there's no need to ask this question. He already paid the price when they first met. Referring to the former creatively drawing him out of hiding with a key attack. Coily giggling at this, the Saiyan apologizes. He thought he was being watched and that was the only way to make him show himself. Causing Soba to scoff. Well, aren't you discreet? 
just show up here and turn their tranquility upside down. Getting back to business, the wise man states that feeling one's key is an important first set. This technique allows one to move their mind and body towards the key they visualize. They must close their eyes and clear their minds. Goku thinks to himself that going back to Earth and feeling the key of his friends is all but impossible from all the way out here. Gushu opts to raise his own key so they can find him more easily, the amount of which surprising both warriors. He then tells them to place their index and middle fingers on their foreheads and begin sending their key outward. The key must then come in contact with the surrounding auras. Once they've found his key, they need to project their own towards them. Their body will follow. Figuring it out a bit faster than the Saiyan, Soba chortles that he's got it while bidding goodbye to Goku. Pleading with him to wait. He could have at least explained it to him. It's not easy to visualize Hushu's aura. Why doesn't he try to find Soba's aura instead? Really struggling with this exercise, Goku tries to hype himself up, assuring that he can do it. But the truth is, he really can't do it. But why? He's going to have to ask Hushu for advice. He must have missed something during his explanation. Learning the instant transmission is going to take a little longer than our hero expected. Two months would pass since the defeat of Cold's Elite Squadron. Goku eventually mastered the Super Saiyan state, but this was not the case for instant transmission. And on the 3rd of May, 763, Planet Namek's Dragon Balls were reactivated on Earth to allow the Earthlings to make their wishes. The first being to return the souls of both Krillin and Goku. However, they would learn that Goku was not dead at all. His friends would ask Purunga to bring him back to Earth. And as on our own world, the sky here is also shadowed by an ominous darkness. The dragon quickly explains to Goku that his friends have gathered the Dragon Balls together to ask him to return to Earth. Does he accept this request? Thanking the Sacred Serpent, the Saiyan politely refuses. He still has a lot to learn here. He wants him to tell his friends that he'll come back on his own in due time. The news surprised everyone. They had a hard time understanding Goku's decision. But they were relieved to know he was still alive. While Goku was training on Planet Yardrat, he was unaware that Vegeta had set off into space looking for him, and Frieza was enduring a terrible rehabilitation in order to exact his revenge. As Goku continues to grow stronger day by day, what will Vegeta find out in space and search for the legendary warrior? And as for Frieza, what will his plans be upon returning to full strength? Planet Frieza number 3, May 26, 763. One of Cold's high-ranking soldiers addresses his master. He alerts that according to their sources, a Saiyan named Vegeta attacked one of their military bases. Shima, the female warrior who fled the battle against Goku on Yardrat, was also seen on one of his planets. It's been two months since last hearing from the Elite Squad, so the henchman believes that it's safe to assume they've all been defeated. However, this statement causes another to condescend. The entire squadron, you say? Did he forget that he's still here? If Master Cold doesn't mind, he'll take care of finding that monkey and that treacherous... Biscuit, Shima. Since Cold sent him out on a solitary mission during their time of disembarkment to Yardrat, he couldn't be with his squad. Ergo, the responsibility falls on himself to avenge him. An offer the angry king doesn't hesitate to accept. He instructs him to go straighten them out as he refuses to allow his empire to become the laughingstock of the universe. He's counting on him to bring back the head of that monkey. If he fails, he had better flee before he mounts his head on a pike instead. Is that understood? And possibly regretting his decision, he promises to do his best. Taking off, the fourth member of Cold Squadron went in search of the Saiyan Prince. Planet Litz. A Birdman appears to be wounded from a sword of battle, as a voice off screen barks that he's looking for the Super Saiyan who defeated Frieza. Does he have any information? But the Grunt can only quiver out a chortle at the very idea. A Super Saiyan that defeated Lord Frieza? What a joke! Revealing the other man to predictably be Vegeta, who charges a finishing blast and growls, Well, this clearly isn't my lucky day, but it obviously isn't yours either! As a new ship enters the planet's atmosphere. How strange. A random space capsule? Could it be Kakarot? 
Whoever it is, Vegeta warns they beware. The Saiyan Prince is coming. <laughs> Discovering it's a ship much like the one Goku would have escaped in. Who could this realistically be? Sensing his key, it's not Kakarot. But who is it? Finally meeting face to face. Vegeta questions who he is. A henchman of Frieza? The man utters that's not quite the case. He is Zarok, a member of Cold's elite squadron. He's in the service of Frieza's father. The same man who the Saiyan here dared betray by attacking his military bases. For that transgression, he will die. Scoffing this off, Vegeta asks if he's come here to kill him. Don't make him laugh. His power isn't even a tenth of what he has. However, the villain warns the little monkey not to get too arrogant. He himself has far greater power than the traitor here. Clicking a scouter, Zarek comments that especially when he only registers 55,000. And given what the prince has learned over the past year or so, he finds it unbelievable they still rely on those things. His scouter is wrong. Any warrior worth their weight in salt is capable of hiding their true power. And he calls himself elites anything? Pathetic. <laughs> Showcasing the man's error firsthand, Vegeta grins that he'll have the privilege of tasting his new power. But charging him, it doesn't matter what the scouter says. He has no choice but to fight this to the end. A mentality loved by the Saiyan. That's a real warrior's attitude. So show him what he's worth. He chastises the fiend to stop kidding around and fight. Zarak attack! Slapping away the foe's epitomous attack. He compliments not bad. That technique could have scratched him a little. Where did he go? That little butt lord used that blast as a means of running away. Vegeta bellows that hiding is futile and he will destroy this entire planet if he has to. Behind you, Saiyan! Easily dodging and grappling his arm, Vegeta snarls at attacking from behind like a coward. For that, he's gonna rip his arm off. Doing so, before he kills him, he will answer his question. As the soldier screams in pain, the prince inquires if he knows anything about the Super Saiyan who defeated Frieza. Stunned by this claim, the villain stutters that Vegeta is delusional. Frieza defeated by an inferior race? Which was the wrong answer. The anti-hero extends an arm and piffs that he's no use to him then. But what does he mean? The prince shouts that the Super Saiyan exists and he will be the next. Reminding us how grumpy Namek era Vegeta used to be, he mumbles that there's no trace of Kakarot here. He will find him and destroy him. While he headed back to Earth, on Frieza Planet 73, things were about to change. As Mr. Freeze gets accustomed to his new Victor Stone parts, Information regarding the defeat of the last member of Cold Squadron reaches the headquarters. The yellow-haired henchman from before iterates that according to the data they received from Zarak Scouter, the Saiyan he met on Planet Litz was none other than the Saiyan Prince, Vegeta. What's even more astonishing is that the latter is in the services of His Majesty, Lord Frieza. Leading the tyrant to think, the Saiyan, the traitor, could he have defeated his son? Could this be the Super Saiyan the legends talk about? That can't be possible. They must eradicate this threat. They are, and will remain, the most powerful race in the universe. He states aloud that fortunately, Frieza is in good shape again. He will take care of this. Who takes a pause in his training upon noticing that his father looks upset? Entering, he returns to his bratty attitude demanding to know what's happening here. The sound of him yelling is distracting. The king apologizes before telling how a member of his squadron encountered difficulties on a certain planet. He's found it all quite upsetting and doesn't want to bother him with it. Perking an eyebrow, the former questions his honesty about caring for his subordinates. 
Don't bull pucky him. He knows enough about his own father to know that he doesn't give a dang about his subjects unless it's a serious threat. And Cole can easily see that Asuna has perfectly called his bluff. He admits that he has tracked down the traitor Vegeta. He wanted to make him pay for defeating him. But Vegeta? Laughing aloud at the thought, did he really think that worm was capable of leaving a mark on him? He killed Vegeta on Namek. Although this claim likely confusing his father, Frieza curses those Saiyans. He was sure that he had exterminated them all except for the three that served him. Of course, we know he means Vegeta, Nappa, and Raditz. And Broly. His father Paragus. And those Saiyans who were on the mission with Kid Vegeta. And Tarbal. And Turles. And even though he's kind of just a gag, even Onio for being anal about it. And of course, every real DBZ fan remembers Terrace. Back to the story. Frieza knows now that he has no choice but to believe the legend of the Super Saiyan does exist, since he was defeated by a golden-haired Saiyan on Namek. Anyway, that legend died with the explosion of that world. But a Saiyan with golden hair? Like the one that defeated their ancestor Chilled? Incredible. A Yardrat soldier told him about the arrival of a Saiyan aboard a space capsule belonging to the Ginyus. It departed from planet Namek. Up until now, Frieza had no idea that Saiyan survived. But it's no matter. They can let Goku think he himself is dead. He'll be terribly shocked when he sees him waiting for his return to Earth surrounded by the corpses of his friends. August 5th, 763. It's been two months since Goku first began to identify the auras that were moving around him. After all this time, he had finally become able to completely visualize a person's aura perfectly and follow it with his mind. Interrupting his meditation, Hushu floats over to inform that they've done enough work on key visualization. Now all that remains is to teach him how to teleport. Coming to a bit of surprise to our hero, is he really ready? With a grin, the old timer winks he is. He will finally master instant transmission. Soba achieved this quickly, though to his credit, he probably had plenty of time to master the basics from the Yardrats when he became their leader. So... Son Goku must listen carefully to his explanations, and he too should be able to teleport perfectly. Step one, he must concentrate. For this, he'll have to clear his mind. Step two, clearly detect and visualize the source of key he wants. Step three, the most difficult step. He must concentrate his key to his forehead by sending it up through his hand and focusing it towards the key of the person he desires. Once he has completed these steps, he will be able to teleport. Zipping away, he urges Goku to come join him. Who clacks his fist telling himself that he can do this. He won't give up. One, he must clear his mind. Two, find Hushu's key. Three, visualize Hushu and send his mind and key to him. But two hours later, Goku's beginning to think he may have missed something. Nothing's happening causing the wise man to fall to his knees in frustration. What a dumbo! He's only 800 meters away! Which to us brilliant imperialists is 363 feet. Goku had been training for months to master instant transmission without much success. Fatigue, concentration, and hunger were his main reasons for failing. At one point, he even considered giving up, but his fiery spirit pushed him to continue. The venerable Hushu continued suffering from an illness that affected his heart. For the second time in only a short amount of time, he fainted. As Goku continues a struggle to learn instantaneous movement, what is this mysterious illness that has befallen Hushu? June 7th, 764. This was the day Goku finally mastered the art of instantaneous movement, but it was also a tragic day for the Yardrats. In a deep focus, there's no doubt in Goku's mind that aura is Hushu's. His energy is descending rapidly. What's going on? Is this a test? No, he's in bad shape. Soba is also there with him. Heading after him, he only hopes they can wait a moment more. In a hospital room, Soba questions a doctor if he's going to be okay. But unfortunately, the medical staff can only apologize that his time is short. He may have been sick for a long time without knowing it. What he has may also be contagious. 
the warrior now worries that some of their own people may have contracted this disease without knowing it. Managing to track him perfectly, Goku finally did it. He teleports in asking what's going on here. Soba explained that Hushu had a heart attack, but at this time, his condition is worrying. His prognosis is that his ailment could be contagious, and Hushu himself has very little time left to live. Leaving our hero to then question what they can do to save him. It's then revealed to him there's nothing they can do. At this point, there is no saving him. The old timer at last whimpers out his first words of the scene. Merely, he's happy to see the Saiyan has finally mastered the instant transmission. Which, yeah, but they're here for him. Causing Hushu to look towards Soba. Before he leaves this world, he wants him to give him his hand. This is very important. Doing so, he doesn't mince words and simply thanks his son. But his son! The Elder monologues that he is Hushu, the last of the wise men of their native people. When their planet came under fire from Frieza's forces, he left Yardra to prepare their cousins, as well as to ensure the continuation of their knowledge of their own race. When he arrived with his family, Soba's mother wanted him to teach their son the secret techniques he had developed. He refused for the fear that they would fall into Frieza's hands if he had ever decided to betray them and join Frieza's army, like Soba's brother Zindel. During the first assault of the Ginyu Force on planet Yardrat, Hushu saw Soba surrender to them. He felt betrayed by what he thought was a lack of courage on his part. The people were safe, but they were enslaved, stripped of their freedom, faced with the guilt and shame that gnawed at himself. He felt that exile was the only option open to him. But then there was Goku in the attack of King Cold's forces. He could finally see the son he had always wanted, a true warrior who risked his life to save others. The arrival of the Saiyan has changed Soba. He has grown, and Hushu has found his pride. He again thanks his son, pleading he never forget who he is. As the life fades from his father's eyes, Soba can only hope that he'll forgive him for not having lived up to his expectations. But at the same time, it should be noted that Hushu is one bum-ass dad. Hushu's death brought sadness to the entire planet. Even Goku, who is usually so carefree, was saddened by the death of the one who was the master of this planet. But he also felt great frustration in the fact that there was nothing he could do to prevent this. He, who possessed such mighty power, was once again helpless in the face of the death of another friend. Hushu left this world, but his spirit and teachings continued to live on through his disciples and his son Soba. Then we have to wonder, what happened to Shima? The last we heard of her, Cold's men had discovered she had visited one of the king's planets while fleeing Yardrat. After suffering defeat at Son Goku's hands, she could not return to headquarters for fear of being killed by King Cold. So she deserted. Questioning her purpose in the universe, she decided to resume her desire to defend oppressed people in order to ease her conscience. But during one of her raids on a garrison of Frieza soldiers, she was shocked to learn that Frieza was still alive. She then remembered the Saiyan who saved her life. She had to do something to repay her debt to him. Searing through the sky, she hopes it's not too late. That's how Shima, ex-commander of King Cold's elite squadron, left for planet Yardra once more. This time, to warn Goku of the imminent departure of his sworn enemy Frieza to planet Earth. September 25th, 764. Just somewhere in the universe. Staring out the window, almost getting lost in his own thoughts, Frieza questions if they've detected planet Earth yet. Which they have. It's located in the northern galaxy. They can be there in 20 days. Bringing no second thought to the tyrant, they will head there now. He looks forward to destroying Goku and his friends. Soon, the Super Saiyan will become a forgotten myth. When a particular ship passes him, a grunt informs that the approaching vessel is Shima's, prompting Cold to demand contact with it. He screams out to the warrior that this is her king addressing her. As soon as he returns from his mission to Earth, he will kill her for betraying his empire. <sighs> Only laughing at this. She chuckles that with all due respect, he shouldn't delude himself with such fantasies. First, he'd have to kill that Super Saiyan, and she doubts he's man enough. Only angering him further, he will make sure her death is a painful one. 
He instructs his men to stop the ship. He will kill her himself right now. His son, however, objects. Let her live. She now knows they're leaving for Earth. Goku will be plunged into despair when he sees his son, his friends, and all of the Earthlings reduced to dust. September 30th, 764. Ready procedure on planning your drag. Initiated. Chilling blow. Silva questions if Goku thinks he's strong enough now. Who says no doubt? He'd like to fight him when he's even stronger, though. Causing him to reply for the Saiyan not to cowpie him. He's a Super Saiyan. There's nothing he can do against him. <laughs> Upon Shima gently tapping down on the Quiet World, they can sense she's back. Sticking to her location, even Goku wants to hurry before disaster strikes. Soba states that he would like to be the one who faces her this time. <laughs> Jumping out of the crater, she clearly wasn't expecting to see them so abruptly, as she only has to offer a timid and confused, hello. As they don't respond, she can't help but receive the icy welcome ironically, though she's happy to see the Saiyan is still here. The son of Hushu barks to know what she's doing on this planet. Was her last defeat not enough? Prompting the ginger to snarl back to the toad head that she isn't here as an enemy. She found out something important and came to warn them of the imminent arrival of Frieza and his father King Cold to planet Earth. Coming to the great horror of Goku, Frieza's heading to Earth? Soba remarks that the Saiyan should have made sure of Frieza's death before he proclaimed his victory. But he argues this is impossible. He did finish him off. Even if he survived that final attack, he should have died in that explosion. If Shima's estimate is right, Goku should be able to make it to Earth in 15 days if he leaves now. She will stay here to defend the planet with Soba, the leader of the Yardrats. Believing this all rather quickly, though fortunately, Goku states that his friends are in danger, so he needs the spaceship he came here in. Lucky for them, it's been fixed since his arrival. The three head off. 20 minutes later. Getting emotional at the reality of the situation, Soba takes Goku to his craft, which has been programmed to go to Earth as its next destination. He doesn't know how to thank him for what he's done for his people, but he must finish off this tyrant once and for all. His reign of terror must end. As for Shima, she promises to do whatever it takes to earn his forgiveness, begging for him to defeat Frieza as well. Although, doesn't she too want to fight Frieza and his father? Which I'm sure she would, but she already knows they would kill her easily. With that, he thanks Soba for everything, hoping they can meet again someday. And that's how Goku left the planet Yardrat. August 15th, 764. Above our positive adjective world, Frieza grins with malice thinking that soon, son Goku will taste his vengeance. His father, bored by the situation, inquisitively inquires if this is Earth. They could destroy it without getting off the ship. But that's not enough for his son. He wishes for the Super Saiyan to taste true despair at the sight of his friend's corpses scattered around him. He will take his time torturing them one by one until he gets here. The gap between Frieza's ship and Goku's was narrowing. In three hours, Goku would arrive on Earth. But would he be there in time to prevent the catastrophe that Frieza was planning? Each of the Z Fighters reacted to the arrival of the Tyrant, some knowing firsthand who it is, and others knowing it could be nobody else. The end of the world drew near. The faces of Earth's warriors contorted in fear as they felt the incredible power emanating from the ship as it approached their planet. A giant shadow eclipsed the sky as the spaceship descended into Earth's atmosphere above the heads of our warriors. They were forced to watch helplessly as the terrible tyrant of the universe came ever closer. Our heroes hid their key to prevent being spotted by the few scouts and warriors aboard the ship as they began to assess the situation and form a plan. As Frieza's vessel landed, the horror of our heroes was further magnified when they discovered an equally sinister aura accompanied them. With Frieza and Cold landing on Earth, will Goku be able to reach them in time to save them? Or will a mysterious youth from the future make his unexpected appearance to save our heroes? Now landed on our world, Frieza gazes at the wasteland around him. So this is Earth. Overall, not a bad planet. Seeming to have previously detected Goku's ship, Cold scoffs that they have three hours until his Super Saiyan arrives. Does his son wish to merely wait for him? 
who responds, but of course, they can take the time to flush out his friends and kill them one by one. However, it turns out they don't have to go hunting after all. With the arrival of the familiar Piccolo, Frieza chortles to know what the Namekian's doing here. With Vegeta and Gohan in tow, he bellows that if he's going to die today, he'd rather go out having fought with all of his strength. Not having planned for their arrival, Vegeta inquires if he really thinks he can stand up to these two alone. And considering his not-so-friendly relationship with the gang and his recent time off planet, Big Green is surprised to see him here. The Tyrant can't help but find joy in the entire cavalry arriving to the scene. Gohan echoes a Saiyan counterpart. They will fight this to the end, just like on Namek. Raising a hand, Frieza is glad to see him all here. He has two things he wants to tell them. First, Son Goku will arrive on Earth in three hours. Second, they won't live to see him killed. But we have to ask a third. Where is Future Trunks? The news of Goku's arrival stuns our heroes. He's really coming back? This changes everything. With this new information, not all is lost after all. Noticing the smart girl on his face, the villain snarls to know what the Namekian's smiling about. Do they really think they have a chance against him? Kill them all! Taking a backflip, Gohan takes off as Piccolo instructs him to lead the soldiers to the others. They can beat him. He and Vegeta will try to contain Frieza and the other guy until Goku arrives. The youngster complies, but warns his mentor to be careful. The young Saiyan darts away from the grunts while taunting them to catch him if they can. With no communication, Krillin has to wonder why Gohan is bringing Frieza's soldiers over here. And to be fair, he is putting Yamcha in great danger. Alas, he figures he wants them to take care of the goons. Jumping into the sky, Krillin alerts everyone to close their eyes. Kaioken! Flooding in, Tien offers to be the one to take him out. Go and obliterating them! Yamcha cheers him on from the sidelines. However, now isn't the time to celebrate. They have to go help Piccolo. With whom? Vegeta grits that Kakarot arrives in three hours. Does the Namek think they'll be able to survive until then? Who pretty much says probably not. But you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Prompting Frieza to step up to the plate and cackle that he will take his time in slaughtering all of them. He wonders just how long they'll last. Even the king himself decides to get in on the action. It's been a while since he had a good fight, so he's gonna have some fun with this. Come on, I'm ready. Shida. Annoyed with Vegeta's aggression, Frieza huffs that at this rate, they'll never last until the other Saiyan arrives. Who likely feels the same. This guy hits hard. Cold Snickers to know what happened to Vegeta Saiyan Fire and Fury. Get up and show him what the Saiyan Prince is worth. Causing the Saiyan Prince to wipe the blood from his face and scream that he will defeat him and Frieza, even if he has to destroy this planet. His ugly face pisses him off. Utilizing what is likely the only chance they have, Piccolo charges a special beam cannon wanting to take advantage of the distraction while he's got Cold busy. But Frieza doesn't think so. He's not about to let him try anything cute. <laughs> the tyrant hisses that he hates meddlers like him. But by all means, continue resisting. Stem his boredom while he waits for the Super Saiyan. No match for the Elder Frost Demon. He's so fast and strong, Vegeta hasn't even touched him once. For Cold, this was just an inevitable outcome. The Saiyans are poor opponents. I'm not done with you, Vegeta! 
as the Saiyan Prince and Piccolo receive the most one-sided beatings of their life. Krillin notes that both their keys are going down fast. They've got to help them! With the gang largely in silence, the only thing that's clear is they need Goku. Leading Krillin to reveal that he only found one Senzu at Master Roshi's. If they give it to Vegeta, it could make him stronger. He told him once that a Saiyan's battle power improves every time they recover from near death. But he was to give their only Sensu to Vegeta. Has he forgotten what he did to them? Although Tien has objections, Yamcha has to agree with his Turtle School comrade, or at least trust his judgment. The two of them did fight alongside of each other on Namek. Whatever they do, they'll be dead before Goku arrives, so they need to explore every option they can. Two against one, the trio takes off towards the battle, Tien questioning if the others think they even have a chance against these monsters. But just being real, Yamcha bluntly says, absolutely not. They just need to buy time. They'll finally get to see what the training with King Kai was worth. They will fight to save the Earth, whatever it takes. At the same time in space. From here, Goku can't feel either Frieza's key or any of his friends on Earth. Possibly knowing what he's planning, he hisses that the tyrant will gain nothing from waiting. He will finish him this time. Asking if Vegeta can hear him. The sleepy prince opens his eyes to see his valiant savior. Confused. His strength has increased. He can feel it overflowing. Likely deducing that the earthling used one of those beans that healed him during the Ginyu fight. Said earthling inquires if he thinks he'll be able to beat them now. While that's still up in the air, the warrior is excited to find out. With Yamcha and Tien tapping down, Cold chortles that it looks like they have some newcomers. Does the sun know them? Who doesn't? Figuring that they must be friends with the Saiyan. <laughs> the tyrant cackles that no matter how many of these vermin there are, they have no chance to avoid their planet's fate. Piccolo chimes back to not count them out yet. They're still alive. As the fighters who actually trained on King Kai's world fire up the Kaioken, Gohan notices their key suddenly increase. Chaozu realizes that this must mean they decided to defy Master Kaio's ban on the Kaioken. But the Kaioken? The boy knows that's the technique his dad used against Frieza and it wasn't enough. There's no hope. His father won't make it in time, leaving the child feeling useless. They can only look up to the sky and plead for Goku to hurry. Jumping from the ship, Frieza ushers the brave Earthlings on. He will honor their stupidity by facing them himself. Racing in, Piccolo reminds everyone not to do anything reckless. They have to resist until Goku arrives. Replying to Frieza, Tien shouts that they will honor Son Goku for all he's done for them. Impressed by his resolve and resilience, Cold takes the moment to offer the Namekian a spot on his new commando. Who'd rather die than join the likes of him? Responding with such passion, the tyrant then comments on the ardor and the Namex blows. With a duo of Yamcha and Tien, the former tells his comrade to get ready for the crane combo. A little hesitant, the latter questions if he's sure. And as fate would have it, Frieza's willing to let them have a free shot. Hit him with all of their might! Whoa! Using his signature move, the villain is volleyed over to Tien. Hit him now! Go -ho! Although, Krillin knows as well as us that using the Kiko Ho is going to put Tien's life in danger. The Space Lord has to admit that was a very clever combo. However, <laughs> hitting him over and over again, his body isn't going to hold out at this rate. Sure enough. Only seconds later, he runs out of strength. More or less just annoying him, Frieza screams that he's sick of this! That's enough! But given this chance, the gang decides to attack him together. Even Gohan finally gets in on the fighting. Struggling to keep their foe stationary like their life depends on it. They can't relax for a single moment. If they keep attacking him from a distance, he can't attack back directly. Why 
Wisely or not, Bulma can't keep herself quiet and urges the others to cheer their friends on with her. Take that! <sighs> Don't give up! We must hold on until Goku arrives! <gasps> you still believe that? As Piccolo appears to be the first loss in this fight, will this bring our heroes right back to where they began after the arrival of Raditz? If Earth loses the Dragon Balls again, and they somehow find a way to win this battle, how will they bring Piccolo back without knowing the location of New Namek? Cutting Piccolo down. The king mocks if the Namekian will be able to regenerate himself in this state. Charging in, Gohan can't control his emotions, even despite Krillin's protests. Fortunately, Vegeta arrives just in time to intercept him. He hisses for him not to die needlessly. Glaring up at the Saiyan, the Galactic Overlord queries if he's finished with his little nap. King Cold, father of Frieza, so-called king of the universe. He is the head of the Planet Trade Organization. In this story, he is the general who sends the Elite Squadron to Planet Yardra in order to kill the Saiyan responsible for the defeat of Frieza, thinking it was actually Vegeta. Although he's at the top of the most powerful race in the universe, his power is inferior to that of his son's. At least if we're under the assumption the form he usually takes is his full potential. He takes advantage of his imposing stature to give an illusion of power. Then, Vegeta. The proud Saiyan prince who traveled to Earth with his companion Nappa after Raditz's defeat. He fought Frieza on planet Namek and was killed before being resurrected by Purunga. After Frieza's defeat, he trained hard by destroying many of his military bases. Having become much stronger, he waits for the return of his rival Kakarot to take his revenge. Before that, he's going to have to face Frieza and his father. Is his new power enough to defeat these terrible enemies? The proud Saiyan is eager to show him. I can't stand your face! I'm gonna erase that smug look! However, new power, same results. He grabs Vegeta's face and cackles that this poor wretch still thinks he can take him on. The prideful arrogance of the Saiyans annoys him. The villain powers up an energy ball done with this battle. All the while, he chortles that Vegeta made a lot of noise for nothing, bidding him farewell. On the ground again, there's nothing he can do. Same goes for the others. With their own plan also not going the way they'd hoped, Yamcha calls out for Krillin to retreat, but he's not willing to leave their friends behind. Unfortunately, the Frost Demon isn't going to give them the option to escape. As two more of our heroes fall to the ground, Frieza bellows that they should be grateful that he so much as let them take a shot at him. In fact, he's pretty sure that attack just now didn't even kill him. Alas, this only leads him to crescendo into a signature laugh while admitting if only because I'd like to see them die slowly. Saiyan becoming enveloped in a golden aura. This is impossible. What's going on? Looking to our protagonist, Boma pleads for Vegeta to hang in there. He's their only hope. And Gohan seeing this. Vegeta. He has the same energy as his dad. Has he also become a Super Saiyan? I'm getting pushed away! Shocking twist. Vegeta somehow tapped into the faux Super Saiyan form Goku used in the Lord Slug movie, obliterating Cold in nearly the exact same way Goku defeated King Piccolo. But the sad truth is, he, like all the others, has fallen out of the battle. A frightened Gohan turns to his mentor to question if he thinks his dad will get here in time to save them, but unwilling to answer the obvious truth. He only warns the child not to try anything stupid and to only focus on saving himself. And witnessing the death of his father, the same who resurrected him and didn't even want to land on this planet in the first place, 
Frieza offers barely a pittance of sentiment for his progenitor. He howls, well done, monkey scum. He killed his father. Although he cares very little for his death, he refuses to accept the fact that these Saiyans continue to ridicule him. They will all die for this affront. Two hours and 30 minutes before Goku's arrival, facing off against the son of the warrior who defeated him. He believes Gohan to either be fearless or a complete fool. We'll see. He doesn't plan on killing the boy right now. He wants to see Goku's face contort in pure terror as he watches the life fade from his eyes. Causing the child to power up and shout that he's not afraid of him. He will do anything to stop him from killing his friends and he's not giving up. Gohan, no! Frieza with all of his strength. The monster brushes it off like it's nothing. Sending Gohan to the ground. He barks if the stupid monkey really thinks he can beat him. In space. Sensing what's going on, Goku just felt his son's key plummet. Chouch is heading towards Korin's tower, no doubt to hopefully get some senzu beans. Vegeta, Krillin, Piccolo, and the others are all close to death. He pleads for Gohan to hang in there. He'll be back soon. But if he can sense their energies, at the same time on Earth, picking himself up, the young warrior chirps back that he's gonna hold out until his dad gets here. He's gonna see him beat Frieza for good. And such optimism. He certainly is the spawn of Goku. We'll see just how much longer he can resist. Charging his death beam, this is the end. Arriving just as we predicted, Goku makes his appearance much to the surprise of the villain. Bringing his son to tears of joy. He turns to him and instructs to get their friends to safety. He's gonna take care of Frieza once and for all. Upon letting the situation process, the demon screams for Goku to prepare to taste his vengeance. Before, Goku states that he let him live on planet Namek and he immediately threw it back in his face. He never thought he'd survive that last attack or even the explosion of that planet. But he sees now that he'll never stop. Goku can't turn a blind eye to what he's done here today. His reign of terror will end for the good of all the people who's lived under his oppression. Although now held together by what appears to be junkyard parts and multiple conch pieces, Frieza chortles that he's invincible. The Saiyan thinks he can beat him. He then questions how he got here without a ship. By his own projections, his arrival wasn't expected until much later. Who tells how it's thanks to the instant transmission technique he learned on Yardrat. He stayed there for a year to master it completely. The Fiend finds this interesting. He's learned to teleport. He inquires how Goku just said he spent an entire year there, and he's still alive. The Saiyan is a lot tougher than he thought. He had the Ginyu Force sent to that planet with the intention of conquering it, but they gave up. He himself wouldn't be able to send his armies given their weak resistance to the planet's atmosphere. So he left the Ardress free knowing they could be useful to him one day, like the Saiyans who he exploited for years. But our hero doesn't understand. What does he mean? And it's really quite simple. The atmosphere of Yardrat is livable, but it's quite toxic to organisms that don't originate from that planet. Goku is slowly dying from simply being there for so long. He may have escaped Namek's explosion, but he will indeed still die. Prompting the warrior to scoff that Frieza is either lying, or he's a lot stronger than the atmosphere he's talking about. Either way, he's ignored his warnings, so he's going to finish him. Die, son, don't go! It's useless, Frieza! Following a short skirmish, Frieza has to remark on the determination of his blows. Is he finally taking this seriously? It's too little too late. The Saiyan will die along with his planet. Goku snarls not to make him laugh. He was hoping that he'd see the power get between them and give up on his own, but his pride blinds him. He's done giving him chances. Almost to the point of madness now. Our protagonist asks, what's the point? They both know Goku outclasses him. Is it that hard to admit defeat? Giving the villain the opportunity to say what we're all thinking. Goku is very naive. 
The warrior warns him not to even think about it. If he tries to blow up the earth, I'll turn him into ashes. Watching a barrage at the same attack that chopped him in two. He wonders how the Super Saiyan will stop him. Dodging him, he just doesn't learn from his past mistakes. This won't work and he knows it. Then he realizes this is only a distraction. Charging his death ball, Frieza screams that he'll finally get rid of these filthy monkeys and their absurd legend. But using the instant transmission, it's over. And just like that, the fight comes to an end. For the first time in decades, the universe is rid of Frieza and his empire. Peace had returned to the planet Earth. It seemed all was well. But Son Goku was facing an invisible enemy, a heart disease from planet Yardrat. Goku's excellent physical condition had slowed the progression of the virus, but over time, it ate away at him, gradually making him weaker and weaker, until finally, our hero breathed his last. Goku's death left an immeasurable void in the hearts of his closest family, his son Gohan and his wife Chi Chi. The Dragon Balls did not have the power to resurrect him this time. But as one story ends, another begins. Son Gohan trained to become a powerful warrior in his father's image. Soon, he will face powerful and terrifying enemies. But that's a story you already know.